uh, talking about um, classifications for metastatic uh, spine disease this morning. Uh, this is the the overall um, flow of the the talk with the bulk of it uh, on classifications and then a little bit at the end uh, with treatment uh, with respect to the classification systems. So the over over a million new cancer diagnoses are made uh, each year in the U.S. and 10 to 10 to 30 percent of those do exhibit some uh, symptomatic spinal mets at presentation and they are the initial manifestation of mal malignancy in about 12 to 20 percent uh, of cases and mets are the most encountered malignant lesion in the spine. This is the uh, the classic VLT and a kosher pickle that we all learned in med school for the cancers that are are likely to metastasize the bone. Um, listed on the left is in order of uh, precedence, breast being the most common, uh, up to 37%, uh, and then down the line with prostate, lung, kidney, and thyroid, uh, with only about 4% of thyroid uh, cases. Symptomatic lesions typically are in the uh, thoracic spine, up to 70% of those, and then followed by lumbar sacral uh, and cervical involvement. Batson's venous plexus is, um, is sought to be a common culprit for a uh, path of spread um, from those BLT and kosher pickle sites um, in the valvulus and longitudinal, and they drain to uh, the pelvis, ribs, spine, proximal femur, and skull. However, uh, spread is not strictly uh, anatomically determined. Um, a high uh, percent of cardiac output does go to the kidney and muscle, but there's rare mets to these. Uh, so there's a number of um, biomolecular factors uh, that are involved in in the process of metastasis um, to include uh, cell to cell factors, cell matrix, uh, adhesion, uh, growth factor regulation, and then simulation as well as uh, of osteoblast and osteoclastic function uh, with um, uh, things that are released from from the uh, oncologic cells to include the uh, PTH related peptide. Diagnosis, so uh, typically patients who are presenting uh, initially, most frequently will report axial pain, uh, present up to 96% of those patients. Um, typically have progressive uh, non-mechanical uh, unrelenting pain, night pain is common, and also may uh, have radiculopathy or myel myelopathy, either from collapse or from uh, compressive pathology from the tumor burden. Radiographs, um, you can see they're blastic uh, or lytic lesions uh, or, or a mixture of those. Um, just know that it's a not a sensitive uh, study. You need about 50% of vertebral uh, tri trabecular bone loss for a lytic lesion to be identified on, on lateral plane radiographs. And then the classic uh, OITE uh, question would be the, the winking owl sign where you have destruction of, of one of the pedicle, um, one of the pedicles um, leading to that uh, image there on the right. Obviously, you'll need advanced imaging to, to further evaluate uh, these lesions. You want MRI of the entire spine to evaluate for distimates, uh, as well as for surgical planning to see uh, involvement of, uh, of any of the uh, neural elements. Um, CT scan to further uh, delineate the bony destruction and uh, to identify um, or to, to perhaps better identify instability based on how many columns are involved, um, and then surgical planning. And then a, a bone scan to, to more fully evaluate sites of uh, involvement, uh, whether osseous or not. And then knowing that cold, you can have a cold scan with uh, myeloma or renal cell uh, carcinoma. Biopsy is typically going to be the next step um, if you don't have a diagnosis yet. And uh, transpedicular approach is, is typically used either with CT or fluoro guidance. Obviously, the larger the needle bore, the, the higher the yield of the biopsy, uh, more likely to improve um, accuracy of that. Uh, specimen. Uh, and then actually is up to 93% for lytic lesions and 76% for sclerotic lesions, and obviously sending the, the uh, tissue for both path and culture. One thing uh, I didn't realize if, if lymphoma is in the, the differential, then flow cytometry uh, should also be done, uh, particularly if you're looking for um, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, um, and that can be, flow cytometry can be diagnostic for, um, for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. This is a, um, a general flow chart for kind of the, the workup um, for patients who present with pain. Obviously getting a full uh, clinical history uh, to include both personal and family history of cancer. Um, if they have any private diagnoses or if they have known metastatic cancer, certainly. Um, physical exam and, and uh, looking for any uh, neural deficits uh, and then focused uh, radiographs. 
if if there's no suspicion on any of those things going down the left side of the column, I've seen uh, non-surgical treatment and then they follow up with any uh, persistent or new symptoms. And then if any of those things are true, um, at that initial visit, uh, going down the right side of the column, obviously getting a full spine MRI, getting a relevant laboratory evaluation, uh, you know, things like SPEP, UPEP for multiple myeloma, uh, your uh, CBC, uh, thyroid panel, um, uh, basically looking for the common culprits for those uh, BLT and kosher pickle um, laboratory abnormalities. Um, and then uh, further evaluation, um, if you do find something on on MRI, uh, getting a CT chest abdomen pelvis. Uh, if they do not have a primary diagnosis, looking for that primary lesion, um, and then bone scan and chest X-rays, and uh, planning biopsy for um, for the lesion that is most easily accessible. And into the the bulk of it with the classification. So uh, this older classification uh, proposed in 1980 by Anneking. It's really more for uh, kind of long bone uh, lesions or uh, soft tissue lesions. Um, looks at the grade of biologic aggressiveness at the setting, uh, anatomic setting, and then presence of METs. Um, but as you see in the, the chart there, it doesn't account for the epidural space or extension, um, and it's not really suited to uh, describing tumors about the, the spine. Uh, Weinstein, Boriani, Biagini, I believe is how you say that, um, that divided the uh, the spine into 12 uh, radiating zones kind of oriented with the, the clock face and then also five zones um, from superficial to deep including extra osseous uh, intraosseous superficial and deep extradural and, and intradural they had a series of 24 patients um, and they noted some varying recurrence rates depending on where the the lesions were located so if it was in the vertebral body and the posterior elements, it was 24% versus only the anterior elements uh, showed a 0% recurrence rate in their, their cohort. Um, if it had extra osseous ex extension and paraspinous uh, musculature, that was 20%, uh, 21% uh, versus one of the other. One of the other was uh, only about 10% of recurrence rate. And then depending on where the, in the, the table there in the bottom right, depending on where the um, zone was, uh, for their uh, clock code uh, kind of determine their their planned uh, resection. Tamita also has a uh, uh, developed a classification. Um, his included, instead of looking at just one, a single vertebrae, um, he included for that type six kind of contiguous uh, vertebrae or type seven non-contiguous. So some, a bit more of a holistic uh, uh, classification system. And then uh, type one through three, starting anteriorly and extending posteriorly into the pedicle and lamina, uh, and four into the epidural space, and then five into the paravertebral uh, extension. Uh, and then type six and seven, as we mentioned. He had 18 patients who had type three or greater lesions, um, and all those were uh, treated with uh, N-block spondylectomy with stabilization. They noted good uh, pain relief in, in 17 of those patients. Uh, and 11 out of the 15 had a nerve deficit that was improved. This is the epidural spinal cord compression scale. Um, this was a attempt to uh, provide a scale for future study uh, that could be used in, in, uh, in studies to kind of evaluate compression on the cord. Um, grade zero was bone only disease. All the grade ones uh, there are without um, cord compression, but varying levels of, of deformation. Uh, of either the thecal sac or abutment of the spinal cord. Uh, and then grade two, there was cord compression, but with uh, CSF visible, and grade three, no, no visible CSF around the cord. And they just noted in the study that their scaling system had good inter and, and intra observer reliability. Harrington uh, in 86 proposed his own classification in, uh, for metastatic disease. Um, fairly uh, simple um, classification system. Really useful in, in evaluating kind of surgical indications. For instance, you know, any neural involvement, intractable pain, instability, those things are all kind of included in, in there, uh, but limited in its objective measurements. Um, and so, for instance, you know, paraplegia or radicular pain would be classified in, in the same category, and, and those are uh, obviously, you know, different entities. <clears throat> so it's of, of limited prognostic value. Here's the... Uh, Spine instability neoplastic score. Um, 
the table uh, eight there on the right showing the the different items included in the scale to include location uh, pain relief when you're recumbent uh, the type of bone lesion the spinal alignment uh, on x-ray vertebral body collapse whether more or less than 50 percent uh, and posterior lateral involvement of the spinal elements um, and getting getting your score by adding up those uh, different categories score of of 13 or greater demonstrated uh, instability uh, and 7 to 18 they said warranted a surgical uh, cons consultation but overall this this uh, score was noted at poor intra observer and inter observer agreement this is the the tomita scoring um, nice in the sense that it gives uh, both a prognostic score um, as you can uh, see on the right there as well as uh, your treatment goal I'm not sure if you guys see my, my mouse here but uh, treatment goal with associated surgical strategy so on this left chart here um, the adding up the prognostic factors both the primary tumor the visceral mets and bone mets um, and then that gives you a prognostic score of two to ten which subsequently provides a treatment goal whether long-term local control all the way down to the bottom at terminal care for the table on the right and then an associated surgical strategy uh, with that score uh, they had 67 patients who they evaluated retrospectively um, and uh, depending on the score kind of determined your mean survival that you can see in the the items on the left there um, all the way from 38 months uh, with a score of two to three uh, or if you had a score you know eight to ten mean survival was was about five months Tokashi in, in 1990 um, proposed this original score um, again factors looking at overall condition of the patient, the extra spinal bone mets, uh, number of mets in the vertebral body. Um, and then uh, you'll note there the primary site of cancer is is a um, has associated scoring uh, with it that we'll talk, touch on in, in his revised score as well. <coughs> he noted um, if he had a score of nine or greater, uh, they survived an average of, of 12 months or more. And if it was five or less, uh, they survived three months or less. This is his revised score. Um, and then the, the really the main the only thing you revised was was the uh, scoring associated with the primary set of cancer. So you kind of got some more granularity on that. Uh, again, a, a higher number is a better prognostic indicator. So you see thyroid there at the bottom with the score of five, as opposed to lung or osteosarx uh, with a score of zero. Um, and a similar uh, algorithm on the on the left side there, with a total score of twelve or more indicating excisional procedure. Or if they had nine to eleven um, uh, with Mets in a single vertebra. This is the the sword classic. Um, they looked at six hundred forty nine patients, had a multivariate Cox um, uh, regression analysis uh, to look at factors that were independently associated with survival. You see those factors on the right. Um, a lot of these have been uh, included in, in the prior scores that we've uh, talked about. One that's new is the ECOG uh, performance status. Uh, so that's a um, kind of a mobility score. A score of four would be completely chair or bedridden 100% um, of the time. A score of three is, is about you know 50% or more of the time they're in a chair or bed. And then improving as you get lower in numbers and a, a zero would be normal. Um, a ECOG zero would be kind of normal uh, ambulation status. Um, so they, they included that in their score as well as uh, prior systemic therapy, the white count and hemoglobin. Um, and based on the uh, the number of points that you got, kind of gave you a probability of survival at 30, 90, and, uh, 30, 90 days and out to a year. This is a, a further work that did, they did providing, uh, instead of a scoring system, they used a nomogram to uh, give a total number of points and then again associated a number of 30, 90, and, and one year survival. Category also came up with a, uh, a score system uh, looking at uh, a score greater than seven, gave a survival rate of 27% at six months, and then only 6% at one year. Um, and similar similar items here in their scoring system uh, as, we've, as we've seen. This is a, a nice study of retrospectively evaluating all the different scoring systems since uh, there are quite a number of them um, to, to try and figure out what which could best predict um, survival after surgery and they found that uh, the sorgonogram actually had the highest accuracy of predicting the 30-day and 90-day survival after surgery 
and the original Tokashi was uh, the most accurate in predicting one year survival. So a lit review looking at six classification systems and, and 23 scoring systems. And they wanted to uh, to find the factors that exert the greatest effect on outcome uh, to good, uh, or they found that the greatest effects were functional status, uh, the number of visceral mets and, and primary tumor pathology. Uh, and they also saw that there's a number of things that were not currently accounted for in the scoring systems uh, to include whether the treatment is initiated kind of as soon as you find it um, and whether uh, administration of bisphosphonates or, or rank ligand antibody were utilized in their treatment. Uh, and no scoring system has, has been reported to uh, have a consistency of 90% or higher between the expected and actual survival periods. Uh, lastly, in a few, few slides on treatment, this was uh, back in 1978, looking at an epidural spinal cord compression uh, for metastatic tumor. Uh, they had 235 patients. They looked at a radiation therapy alone versus decompression followed by uh, radiation therapy. Um, uh, 65 patients who had both, and then 170 for uh, only radiation therapy. The primary outcome was ambulation after treatment, and uh, pain was the primary symptom at 96%. While motor sensory deficits uh, were found in, in 82% of them, and they didn't find in this study any difference uh, in outcome uh, between the two arms. Uh, and then uh, Patchell came along in about 2003 uh, with this um, kind of landmark randomized study, uh, similar setup, we're looking at <clears throat> surgery followed by radiotherapy or, or radiotherapy alone. And again, the primary endpoint was the ability to walk uh, and secondary endpoints, uh, as you see, urinary incontinence, muscle strength, functional status, uh, need for steroids and opioids, survival time. And they actually uh, uh, ended the study early uh, because the, the criteria met for um, the early stopping. They, you see a pretty pretty uh, amazing results for the decompression and radiotherapy versus just radiotherapy alone. 84% uh, of the patients um, uh, were able to, uh, significantly more patients in the surgery group, 84% were able to walk after treatment. Um, you had patients who had the surgery also retain the, retain the ability to walk longer, so 122 days versus 13 days. Uh, and more patients were regaining the ability to walk, 62% uh, versus the 19%. Uh, and they showed that the, the decompressive surgery bus plus uh, therapy was superior to, to radiotherapy alone. This is a, a systematic review, and they wanted to see if there's optimal timing between when that radiotherapy and uh, surgery should happen, primarily to decrease wound complications uh, and, and define that uh, safe interval. They couldn't uh, find sufficient evidence to give a, a definite conclusion about the optimal timing, other than they said it should be more than, <clears throat> ideally more than two weeks and, and less than 12 months. Um, and uh, inside of that uh, seven days, it increased the wound complications as well as outside the 12 months wound complications arose. Uh, and also last note there that um, Post-op had uh, post-op radiotherapy had fewer complications as opposed to than he had in, uh, radiotherapy. Uh, we also have a, a systematic review and, and uh, a consensus of expert opinion in this study, trying to kind of figure out what the, the practice patterns were uh, for these types of cases. Forty-one percent said they used bone graft uh, or substitutes to accomplish fusion. If it was the anterior reconstruction, most commonly a structural allograft was used, followed by cage re reconstruction in uh, bone cement. Um, and then it was debatable on whether uh, the surgeons were attempting to achieve bone union, uh, particularly for those with the shorter life expectancies. Um, and they said that the literature supported the use of that uh, anterior reconstruction with either a, a prefab prosthetic or the bone cement, and also support the use of an uh, anterior construct. Uh, reinforced with the bilateral posterior instrumentation for three column reconstructions. Another review here kind of um, wanting to evaluate whether minimally invasive uh, surgery and techniques and separation surgery is um, important in these cases. Um, they looked at 29 different articles. Uh, indications were similar and include instability, uh, pain, or, or neurocompromise. And then uh, the uh, variables, outcomes, and, and complications in the MAS studies <clears throat> more similar compared to the traditional approaches, but they, they couldn't give a, a uh, uh, 
Well, actually, they did show a statistically significant improvement in outcomes. Um, and then the, those many open techniques did have good evidence for superiority, but low quality evidence for MIS techniques and, and separation uh, surgery in the treatment of metastatic spine disease. Uh, those are all the, all the references, uh, and that concludes the talk. Good job, Matt. Power pack punch. <laughs> yeah, um, that's, uh, just, just just one one point that I wanted to um, impress upon everybody. For I know it's a metastatic um, talk, but it's not always clear it's metastatic disease. And so um, when we're interacting with our our colleagues and asking for biopsies, it really has to be a holistic approach. And if if it's not clear that it's metastatic, then, then you need to help direct biopsy trajectory because if, particularly if you're not in a tumor center, a cancer center, and you're not privy to the kind of resections that are required for primary disease, then, uh, then, then you're going to need to make sure that the biopsy's done in the right trajectory to favor, favor resection kind of surgery. And that, that just means a lot of collaboration and discussion and, and awareness, most of all that you as the ordering provider are aware of those, those differences. Yes, sir. Do, do um, th these cases come to you all? Are there other kind of providers who, who predominantly do this stuff or what? How does that work? In, no, in I mean, guys? tumors come to everybody. Um, yeah. They come to community spine guys. And, and yeah. so you have to know on the front end how not to get into trouble. It's it's not that uncommon for community guys to to send people for biopsies unaware that, that you have to be privy to that yeah. to that potential for seeding a bed that, that ultimately needed to be protected um, or even get into excisional stuff that they should. So... Um, you know, it's just educating yourself and making sure that you're seeing down the road at, at the care of the patient and uh, knowing where your limitations are. It's okay to reach out for help. But yeah, biopsies are sort of, you know, I think I, I think we generally think of them sort of flippantly. But when you're talking about a tumor, particularly if it's uh, if it may be a primary, you have to be more conscientious about it. Right, sir. Any other input? Well, nice job. All right, thanks, sir.